Hello guys, Namaste, 여러분들 안녕하세요. So today I'm gonna react on Geography Now India. So actually this is not about reaction. This is kind of some learning about some India from this video. So let's watch it together right now. And then today I'm gonna make a stop the video for comments. So please don't be complaining to me. Before start, don't forget the thumbs up. We have finally encroached upon the giant India. Some of you have been waiting a long time for this episode. I'm just gonna say straight up, you all know India is incredibly complex and diverse. Even Indians have trouble understanding their own country. Obviously, I won't be able to scratch into the surface in this episode, but I'll try my best. A lot of you Indian geographers have helped me along the way, so thank you, and without further ado, let's begin. Let's begin. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. This place doesn't even need much of an introduction. Everybody has heard of India. It's big, it's loud, it's colorful, and most importantly, it has a plethora of confusing territorial anomalies that I just can't wait to cover. Here we go. There's an old saying, India is a place where everyone is in a hurry, but no one is ever on time. First of all, India is located in South Asia, right on the Indian and Arabian Seas and the Bay of Bengal, bordered by six other countries, so close to seven, but that land bridge between Sri Lanka got wiped away like 600 oh. years ago by a cyclone. India is divided into 29 states and seven union territories with the capital New Delhi, which is an administrative unit located in the capital territory. Keep in mind, New Delhi is actually just the name of one of the districts in the capital territory made up of 11. The largest city, however, is actually Mumbai, with New Delhi. Bangalore or Bengaluru and Hyderabad following after. However, the four busiest airports are Delhi Indira Gandhi International, Mumbai's Chhatrapati Shivaji International, Bengaluru's Kempe Golda International, and Chennai International in the south. Uh, 사실 제가 인도에 관심을 갖기 전에는 알고 있는 거라고는 단지 문바이랑 델리 딱이두 지역밖에 몰랐어요. 그리고 나머지 지역에 대해서는 전혀 알지를 못했었고 뉴델리와 문바이가 사실 큰지도 잘 몰랐어요. 그냥 문, 델리랑 문바이가 있구나 정도만 알았었고 그 북동쪽 지역에 대해서는 아예 알지를 못했어요 그 지역이 있는지조차도 근데 어, 유튜브를 하면서 그 지역이 있다라는 것을 새롭게 알게 되었었죠 And you know why I'm smiling. This is my favorite part of any episode we ever make. Territorial anomaly time! India is loaded with strange borders and deliciously complex demarcation lines. First of all, what exactly is a union territory? In the simplest way I can put this, union territories are places that are too distinct to be incorporated into a state, but too small to have their own local governments. The first one, of course, is the Delhi National Capital Territory, where the capital lies. Chandigarh is a post-independent city constructed to replace Lahore as the capital of the Punjab area after it was split up between India and Pakistan. Then you have the island territory, Territories, the smallest one, Lakshadweep, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Andaman Islands being home to one of the last uncontacted people groups on the planet, the Sentinelese tribe, whom have been hostile to visitors and are very. 저 지역 자체가 굉장히 관광지로 요즘에 인기 많다고는 하더라고요. 친구도 저 지역적으로 여행을 가자고 한번. 저한테 제시를 했었는데 한국에서는 아쉽게도 저 지역이 여행 경고 지역이어서 정부에서 약간 경고한 지역이어서 저는 쉽게 갈 수가 없어 갖고 고민을 했었죠 근데 나중에 혹시 그 경고가 풀리거나 기회가 된다면 한번 가보고 싶은 지역이긴 해요 그리고 저 지역에서는 원주민이 살면서 사람들에게 화를 쏘는 그 장면으로 저 지역이 약간 유명했었던 적이 있었습니다 therefore left alone, as well as the Nicobar Islands, which actually used to be a short-lived colony of Denmark. Oh. Finally, the three remaining territories are former European colony towns and ports. Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Damat and Diu, which are separated by about 200 kilometers across the Gulf of Kambat, and the most confusing Union territory, the French-speaking Puducherry, which is actually split up between four district cities across India. Karikal, really? Mahe, <laughs> Amaun, and Pondicherry. Pondicherry is strange because it has 11 enclaves within the Tamil Nadu state. Or in this area, you can also find that experimental hippie-ish commune with a little bit of magic. Look it up. Oh, and don't forget, here, the eastern states, also known as the Seven Sisters, are connected by this incredibly narrow 27 kilometer wide pathway known as the Siliguri Corridor. This pathway is like a crucial artery that completes the India puzzle. Or so you would think. Now let's discuss the juices. 사실 저 지역이 제일 제일 궁금했어요. 최근 인도에 대해서 알게 되면서 제가 생각했을 때는 이렇게 역사 어, 삼각형이 된 모양으로 알고 있었거든요. 근데 저 지역이 새롭게 있다라는 걸 알고 나서 좀 많이 신기했었죠. 게다가 저 지역 주민들 자체가 어, 기존의 인도인들하고 다른 모습을 하고 있다라는 거를 제가 새롭게 알게 되었어요. 그때 제가 만들었던 영상 중에 North East Asia looks like Korean 라, 이라고 얘기했었죠. 그때 제가 새롭게 배우게 됐어요. 여러분들의 댓글을 통해서. 그래서 나갈랜드라는 것도 알게 되었고요. 
stuff. Now, in the China episode, I already talked about the disputed areas with India, such as Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh, the latter pretty much just belonging to India as it's almost completely inhabited and operated by Indians. So let's move to the other disputes. Now, as of 2015, the Bangladesh episode is already outdated as India and Bangladesh have finally come to an agreement over the frighteningly complex former Anklin exclave dispute. In the end, India only lost about 40 square kilometers of land to Bangladesh, and now only a few enclaves and exclaves exist. Now let's head now, when you try to draw the shape of India, you might want to be careful which depiction you use. Some might use this picture, some might use this, some might use this, some might use this, some might use might use this. The point is, the whole area is like the most heavily militarized, diplomatically stressed out region on the planet. It's already had like four wars That's in the past right. half century. Basically, India, Pakistan, and to some extent China all want the entire area for themselves, although it's more of like a Pakistan-India thing. In the China episode, we already discussed the Chinese disputes with India, so I won't cover those in this episode. If you want to learn more, just watch the China episode. But anyway, this entire area was a former domain known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Currently, this place is split up by this fenced-off militarized line known as the line of control between India and Pakistan. Why is this? Well, in the quickest way I can put this, okay, the British are out. We get to take your land. Uh, no, we want to be an independent princely state. Uh, we're supposed to take your land, and the majority of your people are Muslim, just like us, even though your ruler is Hindu as well. Hey, India? Yeah. If you help me, I'll let you secede my territory to your land with autonomy. Deal. <laughs> Oh. Ha! Your problem now! I love how Mike played India. He totally represents India. Oh, and keep in mind, Pakistan's capital, Islamabad, is just. 사실 파키스탄하고 인도가 이렇게 분쟁이 생긴 것도 어, 종교 때문이라고 저는 느끼는 했어요. 근데 아무래도 좀 민감한 문제다 보니까 쉽게 언급하기는 힘들겠죠. 그래서 조용히 넘어가도록 할게요. Less than 80 kilometers away from all that drama. The line of control meanders through the mountains until it stops at a point called NJ9842. This is where things get really crazy because from there you hit the Siachen Glacier, the second longest non polar glacier in the world, oh. and this is pretty much the dead man zone. After point NJ9842, you hit the actual ground position line, a series of military outposts that extend all the way to the Chinese border. That means everything in this area is ground zero for the Indo Pak tension. And you know, the crazy thing is there's actually literally small towns of normal, regular civilians living in these areas high up in the mountains, many of which just go about daily life going to work and raising their families. Otherwise, they have a river dispute with Nepal and various river islands disputed with Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top 10 megacities and their own space program, but they also have a copious abundance of landmarks and notable sites, way too many to list, but some of the ones that you guys, the Indian geographies, have told me to mention include places like the abandoned Danush Kodi ghost city, Wakanda Fort, the four pillars of Charminar, the Ajanta Buddhist art Caves, the Alora Monolithic Ruins, Mandu Fortress, the Golden Temple, which feeds over 100,000 people a day, the Golgumbaz Mausoleum, the Kalabantin Durk Post, the Ruins of Hampi, the Hill Forts of Rajasthan, Shatarunjaya Hill, which is basically like a mecca for Jains, the Temple of the Bodhi Tree, Jal Mahal, Vanguard Fort, the most haunted place in India, Mahal. 유령이 제일 많은 곳이 있어요. 저거는 처음 듣는 내용이네. 특히 처음에 나왔던 유령 도시와 방금 나왔던 그 유령. 약간 흥미가 가네요, 그거는. 나중에 한번 다시 한번 알아보도록 할게요. And keep in mind, just like in China, you can find a great wall of India in Rajasthan. There's also the Paritala Anjaneya Temple, wow. the largest statue in India depicting Hanuman. And at over 150 acres, the Sri Rangan Ataswara wow. Temple, the largest Hindu temple in the world. Oh yeah, and there's also that building with the stuff and the thing and whatever. Anyway, we could go on for centuries talking about India's rich, constructed domicile, but what it lies on top of is even more fascinating. Now, don't make this mistake. I'm going to India. All I need are my sandals and sunscreen. Oh, crap. Now, as the seventh largest country in land area, India has a wide range of landscapes, climates, and elevations that all contrast from one corner to the other. First of all, let's talk about the north. India sits on the Indian tectonic plate that essentially smashed into the Eurasian plate, which in return created the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. The force is so strong that it's estimated that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. There's also where you can find Kanchenjunga, the tallest mountain in India, or the third in the world, right on the border of Nepal. Keep your eye on these mountains. These are pretty much the source of most of India's major rivers that give life to the whole country. That's why India takes these mountains so seriously. You can also find the largest natural lake, Rular, up in the Jammu Kashmir area. Below the Himalayas, you reach the north North Indian River Plains, sometimes referred to as the Indus Ganga. This is the most fertile part of India where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south, you reach the Satpura and Bindya ranges that pretty much divide North India from South India. On each side, you get the West and East Ghat Mountains, which in return creates this massive triangle thing called the Deccan Plateau. This place is moderately forest, especially in the East, in the Chotra Nagpur Plateau, where you get a section of the swampy Sundarbans that they share with Bangladesh. Check out the Bangladesh episode. Head a little west and you get the dry tar desert along the border with Pakistan. As 
as well as the run of Kutch known as the Soft Desert. And finally, the only active volcanic area would be the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, with Barren Island having actual conical eruptions and Bharatan having tame mud volcanoes. Now here's the thing, although India has a relatively high population density, they do relatively well with maintaining their ecological footing. In fact, in 2000... 아까 나왔던 그 온도 얘기 때문에 다시 얘기하는데요. 사실 저는 인도에서 잘 알지를 못했었고 그런 지식이 많이 낮았죠. 그래서 제가 인도는 항상 더운 지역이라고만 인식을 했어요. 근데 지금 보니까 확실히 땅이 넓어서 그런지 추운 지역도 있고 굉장히 더운 지역 사막도 있고 그 다음에 적당한 온도를 가진 지역도 있고 그러겠죠. 휴양지 같은 지역도 있고 저의 무지에 대해서 한번 다시 반성을 하게 되네요. 2016, they beat a world record by planting disputably 50 million trees in one day. They've also agreed to reforest about 12% of the country by 2030. The most heavily forested area being the seven sister states in East India. Now, one of the factors that contributes to this would be the fact that India has the lowest meat consumption in the world with the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40%, most of whom are lacto-vegetarians that consume milk products. By the way, in India... 그래서 좀 놀랐던 부분들이 생각보다 채식주의자가 많더라고요. 저는 원래 인도가 채식주의자인 줄은 몰랐어요. 단지 소를 먹으면 안 된다 정도만 알고 있었지 생각보다 많은 사람들이 채식주의자인 거를 제가 처음 알았어요. India, when buying groceries, this label means vegetarian and this one means not vegetarian. Nonetheless, the remainder of the population does typically eat some kind of animal protein, mostly in the forms of seafood or chicken, but almost never beef or pork, unless if you are part of the Muslim or Christian minorities scattered throughout the West and East areas. Now, let's talk about the role of cattle, shall we? India has more cattle and livestock than anywhere else in the world at around 330 million. And it's interesting because since they have prevalent Hindu traditions, the killing of cows is illegal in many of the states except for a few, and each state has varying degrees of punishment for committing intentional cow slaughter. Keyword intentional. Cows accidentally get hit by cars all the time. Once a cow is too old to produce milk, it typically is... 잘 만약에 치이게 되면은 그거는... 또한 처벌을 받는지 궁금하네요. 고의적인 도축에 따라서 처벌 강도가 경해진다고 했으니까 차로 인한 사고는 어떠한 처벌을 받는지 좀 궁금하네요. It's released into the open to die naturally in the wild, ideally. Nonetheless, male cattle get it much worse as they are deemed as kind of useless. Some places use them as draft animals for labor. Some religious sects use them as sacrifices. But otherwise, they are typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides. To this day, there are about six times as many female cows as male cattle in India. So that means, yeah, something's happening to the males. Nonetheless, India does have 소에 대해서는 아까 다 같은 등급인 줄 알았거든요. 소로 저렇게 약간 나뉘는 게 아니라 그냥 모든 소는 다 신성하다라는 건줄 알았는데 그게 아니었네요. Third highest carbon emission rate after China and the U.S. Fourth, if you consider the EU. However, emission per capita, they rank pretty low at only about two kilotons per person. Contrast that with Qatar at about 40. There are 94 national parks, 501 animal sanctuaries across the country, where you can find some of the national animals like the peacock, the Ganges River dolphin, the king cobra, the Indian elephant, and the highest population of Bengal tigers in the world, which are all. Ganges 강이 돌고래가 있나요? 강 수준이 아닌데 그러면은. Highly protected. India also has the most irrigated land in the world, which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products like millet, bananas, lemons, limes, mangoes, ginger, chickpeas, milk, butter, fennel, jute, and about 75% of the world's spices alone come from India. Speaking of which, food! Typically, you can find the staples roti, chapati, and naan in the north, idli and dosa in the south, and everybody eats rice. The more commonly commercialized Indian foods that we in the west grew up knowing, like samosas, tikka masala, tandoori's, and my favorite Indian dish, palak paneer, these usually come from the northern regions of India. Joy favorite is curry and naan. Oh, it's really delicious, this one. Seriously, India, you took spinach and made it fat. I love you guys. Otherwise, the West is mostly known for their chutneys and pickled foods, as well as beef, since there's a high number of Muslims and Christians. The South uses a lot more coconut and has some of the best curries, like poriyal, sambras, rasams, and tutus. And the East is known for having the best desserts, like peda, mishki doi, rasgula, or shondesh. Speaking of which, India is so diverse and complex that sometimes even Indian people need translators when going to different states. It's about to get ten times more confusing in about three, two, one. 친구가 그러더라고요. 한번 인도의 다른 지역을 갈 때는 사실 자기도 외국인이 될수 있다고. 그만큼 지역이 넓고 어, 문화도 다양하기 때문에 그럴 수 있다는 얘기를 하더라고요. 역시 땅이 넓으니까 음식도 다양하고 뭐 이런 것도 여러 가지 다양한 게 많네요. <웃음> Kuru once said, in India, we celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are a land of belonging rather than blood. First of all, India has a population of about 1.3 billion people and is the second most populous country in the world after China with about 18% of the world's population. About 72% of the country is Indo-Aryan and a quarter are Dravidian, and the majority of the remainder are Mongoloid, Asian, and other people groups. They also use the Indian rupee as their currency, they use the Type C, D, and M plug outlets, and they drive on the left side of the road. By the way, technically it's illegal for these banknotes to leave the country, but you guys have sent me a lot of them for fan mail for fan friday videos so i don't want to go to jail 
again. Now keep in mind, those statistics that I just mentioned are incredibly generalized. Of the Indo-Aryan and Dravidian communities, there are about 2,000 different ethno-linguistic people groups in India with about 645 district indigenous tribes, 52 major ones. So obviously we can't cover them all, but what we do know is that the North is very different from the South. For one, the North mostly speaks in languages that are all related to the Indo-Aryan branch, with languages like Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, and Gujarati, whereas the South speaks a completely unintelligible Dravidian branch with languages like Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, and Kannada. <laughs> Other languages <laughs> also pockets of Sino-Tibetan and Austro-Asiatic languages spoken in the far north and east. Wait, so how do they all, like, communicate with each other? Great question! Although India does not have an official language, there are 22 recognized national languages, and of these, two are the most prevalent, taught in schools, and used by government Hindi officials. Hindi and English. English, yeah. And very often, these two are, like, mixed mid-sentence. It's weird. Don't be surprised if you hear someone speaking Hindi and then suddenly finishing off in English. It's like, it's not a good topic, like, where's this? And I was like, what this? And I was, like, trying to, like, why are you trying to do that? I know, right? And the washing machine, I told them, but I said, but I get a Bob Saget with a chainsaw. Now, of course... Yeah, 저건 정말 신기할 것 같아요. 대부분 사람들이 영어를 할줄 안다라는 것도 있고, 한국에서는 이제 사투리라는 게 존재하거든요. 각 지역마다 어, 말투가 조금씩 달라요. 그래서 너, 사투리가 너무 심한 경우에는 알아듣기가 어려운 경우도 있지만 아마 그런 케이스랑 좀 비슷하다고 생각이 들어요. 이런 경우에는. Let's discuss the one thing that goes hand in hand with India, Hinduism. About 80% of India claims to be Hindu, or at least part of the Hindu practicing community. Now, we don't have time to explain everything about the tenets and multi-layered philosophies and practices of Hinduism. If you want to know, just talk to a Hindu person. But basically, one thing you do need to know is that Hindu-driven ideologies pretty much dominate most of life in India, everything from family to business. You will see colorful, mesmerizing shrines, temples, statues, and rituals being performed everywhere, even in public. On the Bharat Mata, the mother of India, statues are everywhere. She's like the symbol of India. The largest Hindu pilgrimage the Kumela happens every three years rotating between four cities in which the adherents bathe in the Ganges River and enjoy a massive festival with tens of millions of people. Like, seriously, you can practically see it happening from space. Now, a controversial topic in relation to Hinduism would be the caste system, which is basically a belief that people are born into a socioeconomic life that they are destined to serve into. Today, however, the system is more fluid and loose from what it used to be from a long time ago. And thanks to economic reforms, anybody with enough drive can kind of move up the social ladder regardless of birth. Nonetheless, India is home to every major religion in the world, even a few Jews, including the Benai Menashe, an indigenous group that claimed to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. In fact, Judaism and Christianity actually had a head start in India way before it even kicked off in Europe. As tradition holds, Cochin, or Malabar Jews, migrated around 1000 BC to trade during the times of King Solomon, and in 53 AD, Thomas the Apostle of Jesus arrived in what is now the state of Kerala to establish the first church in India. Today, most Christians are found in the southwest and far east Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, mostly found in the north, and the second largest Muslim population population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are populated around the northwest areas by Pakistan or in the east by Bangladesh. Oh, and don't forget the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism actually started in India. Today the Dalai Lama... 원래 저 불교 자체가 인도에서 시작한 걸로 저는 알고 있었어요. 근데 어느 순간부터 힌두교가 많이 주가 되면서 불교가 원래 인도에서 나온 게 아니었나라 생각이 들 정도로 헷갈리기 시작하더라고요. Even takes refuge in Tespur in the state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed and diversified India's population is, but what exactly holds the country together? Well, for one, you kind of have to understand Indian history, which will take way too long to explain, but in the quickest way I can put it, Indus Valley, Maurya and Gupta empires, Southern empires, Golden Age, Middle Kingdoms, a ton of new religions come flocking in, the North fell to the Delhi Sultanate, the South became the Vijayanagara Empire, Mughal Empire starts, British East India Company, direct British rule, nationalist movements, independence. Republic, economic liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> Essentially, India used to be made up of around 500 smaller royal princely states, and when the British came in, they kind of exploited them to manage such a huge population. Although India is a democratic federal republic and the largest democracy in the world, the old royal families still exist today, and although they have no political power, they hold high positions of influence in their communities across India. So today, technically, you could meet someone that would be considered an Indian prince or princess. Nonetheless, the biggest thing that really united Indians in the past two centuries would probably be their hatred of British rule. It was kind of like, well... This is not cool. Yep. What do you say you and I work together in a end this thing? Essentially, one good thing you could say that came out of imperialism was that it kind of stopped all the internal squabbling and unified the groups towards one common goal to get rid of imperialism. Today, India. 아무래도 이거는 이제 한국에서 우리가 식민지 시절에 있었던 일제 통치 그 부분과 좀 약간 일맥상통한 부분인 것 같아요. 
proud to be Indian. I mean, a Tamil soccer player can get cheered on by a Rajasthani. A Punjabi pop star can sell out tickets in Orissa. Speaking of which, all Indians love movies and music. India has the second largest film industry in terms of volume, pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year. Surprisingly, Nigeria pumps out more. However, the box office revenues grossed out at only about $2 billion annually compared to Hollywood at over $10 billion. But still, it's impressive. And keep in mind, it's not just Bollywood, but it's also Tollywood, Gollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood, and so on. There's like 20 different woods in India. Oh, like... 자, 발리우드 음악을 리액션하고 난 다음에 얼마 전부터 얼마 뒤부터 사람들이 이제 탈리우드 뭐 이런 식으로 이렇게 여러 가지 우드를 알려주더라고요. 처음 알았어요. 그렇게 많은지. <웃음> 저는 인도하면 무조건 발리우드만 있는 줄 알았거든요. 근데 그게 아니었더라고요. Every movie in India has at least one scene where everybody breaks out in song and there's almost always a happy ending. Unfortunately, mainstream media has also put an aesthetic strain on many of the people as it's almost become an obsession to be light or fair-skinned, causing people to go so far as to buy skin-bleaching products. Some other controversies include things like illiteracy being an issue in many parts of the country, especially in the rural areas. But I mean, come on, when your country has literally hundreds of different writing systems, go figure. I mean, give them a break. Also, 하긴, 저, 저였어도 헷갈릴 것 같아요. 우리나라에 만약에 언어가 22가지가 공용, 공식 언어로 지정되어 있다면 은 굉장히 어려 어려운 일이죠. <웃음> 그냥 자기가 사는 지역의 언어만 익힌다, 익혔다 하더라도 다른 지역으로 갔을 때 그게 완전히 새로운 언어가 돼버리면 은 그것도 문제가 될것 같아요. So many of you guys, the Indian geography groups, have asked me to bring awareness to the fact that India does unfortunately have some of the highest rates of human trafficking and child slavery. The government is trying to crack down and culture is slowly being reformed, but for now, it's a sad reality that still does exist. Hey, here at GN, we talk about the good and the bad. I'm just saying. Otherwise, sports do definitely tie everyone together as well, especially cricket, the national sport, even though they also used to do really well in field hockey. <laughs> 저도 이걸 처음 알았어요. 크리키가 인도에서 좀 이렇게 유명한 스포츠였다라는 것도 처음 알았고 사실 저 스포츠가 있는지는 어, 인도에 관심 가기 전에는 저는 몰랐었어요. 근데 관심 가진 뒤로 아 이런 스포츠가 있었다라는 걸 알게 되었죠. 언제가 기회가 된다면 저도 한번 해보려고요. India also has a lot of their own indigenous sports like Dokkel in Assam, bull racing in Kerala, in Suknar, rod pushing in Mizoram, and Malakamba, this strange pole yoga gymnastics thing in the south. Otherwise, some notable people from India or of Indian descent might include people like Siddhartha Gautam. 저런 스포츠가 있는 건 처음 알았는데요. <웃음> 기존에 전혀 알지 못했던 내용이에요, 저건. Atama or the Buddha, Mahavir, Ashoka the Great, Prithviraj Chauhan, Aurangzeb, Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, Mohandas or Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawaharlal Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, C. V. Raman, Satyendra Nath Bose, Bhagat Singh, Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, Salman Khan, Priyana Chopra, Ben Kingsley, Sundar Pichai, Satya Narayana Nadella, A. R. Raman, Sachin Tendulkar, and Mahendra. 처음에는 몰랐는데 뒤로 갈수록 제가 아는 사람들이 나오니까 반갑네요. 그동안 열심히 했다라는 증거가 될 수도 있겠죠. Now, no surprise, India is huge and therefore has a huge international outreach when it comes to diplomacy to almost everyone. Except their immediate neighbors. First of all, countries with large population percentages of Hindus and Indians like Fiji, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius, and Malaysia typically stay close to India's roster of go to friends. They enjoy cordial relations with trade. Now, the UK may have left on a sour note, but they still have a lot of ties to their former colonizer in terms of business and tourism. India is still part of the Commonwealth, not Commonwealth realm, there's a difference, and the UK has over 1.5 million citizens of Indian descent. As mentioned in the China episode, China is kind of like India's I'm only here to do business with you and nothing else friend. As drama still hasn't subsided in regards to the territory conflicts. Now, when it comes to the U.S., things started kind of sour back in the 70s during the Indo-Pak War of 1971, when the U.S. sided with Pakistan, their arch nemesis. Today, relations have cooled off. Mostly, the U.S. supports India's move towards democracy and is a key ally in the military conflicts in the Middle East. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of the Indians I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia, because during the Indo-Pak Wars, Russia came in and supported them, and ever since then, each country has held a high position of respect for the other, especially as global superpowers. Bhutan and India signed a treaty of friendship almost immediately after independence. The two countries have shared interests and a currency pegged system as well. Bhutan even supported the annexation of their cousins in the Sikkim state into India as it gave a nice buffer of land from China's stake to their claim. In conclusion, you will not find anywhere else on earth like India. Thousands and millions of people inhabiting a colorful, majestic, green, slightly gritty at times slab of earth, blessed and cursed in so many ways, yet wonderfully harmonized, mostly in a unity unlike anywhere else.
In the end, that's India. 이번 영상을 계기로 좀 많은 인도에 대해서 많은 영상 많은 것들을 배우게 되었고 또 많은 것들을 느끼게 되었습니다. 첫 번째로 생각보다 저도 인도에 대해서 많이 모르고 있진 않다라는 거. 예전에는 많이 몰랐지만 많은 영상을 접하다 보니까 인도에 대해서 좀더 기존보다 많이 알게 되었고 그래서 어 저거 나 아는 내용인데 라는 생, 내용들이 생각보다 많이 나왔어요. 그래서 생각보다 반가운 그런 느낌이 들었고요. 그리고 새롭게 알게 된 내용도 많았고요. 왜 저렇게 되었는지도 알게 되기도 했네요. 그래서 여러모로 굉장히 반가운 영상이었어요. 많은 것들을 얻을 수 있는 영, 어, 영상이었고 나중에 기회가 된다면 다른 영상들을 한번더 보고 싶어요. <웃음> 근데 생각보다 이렇게 긴 영상들은 여러분들이 보기에 부담스러울 수도 있고 이 영상을 만드는 저로서 약간 부담스러울 수 있기 때문에 많은 고민을 했어요. 이 영상을 만들까 말까. 항상 만들고 나면 뿌듯함은 항상 있죠. 단지 여러분들이 잘 봐주기를 바랄 뿐이에요. So it was my actually not reaction, just kind of some class. I just learned some India from this video on today. So if you guys like my video channel, just click the subscribe button. And if you guys want to know about me more than YouTube, just follow Insta ID. Thank you for watching my video. And have a nice day. Bye bye.